People told themselves their past with stories, explained their present with stories, foretold the future with stories. The best place by the fire was kept for the storyteller. Chapter 13, Taibo's Deliverance. As already stated, the elder boy, Taibo, was at the beginning of September 1869, taken to the orphanage of St. Charles, near Schlichtenheim. His unhappy mother accompanied him. In the institute, a new and very complete investigation was ordered by his lordship the bishop, under the supervision of the vicar general, Monsignor Rapp, the Abbe Stumpf, president of the seminary, and Father Eicher, the superior of the members of the Society of Jesus in Strasbourg. At the same time, Monsignor Le Amomère Hosser, together with a Strasbourg theologian, Le Abbé Schranzer, kept the boy systematically and closely under the most careful observation. In outward appearance, the boy was very strange. He was very thin and pale and left the impression of a child who had outgrown his years. In his big black eyes lurked something unsteady, something insecure, conveying a strange sensation to those who beheld him. His features were tired and drawn, like a patient's after a long illness. Most of the time, he remained quiet and whiled away the hours with games or with walks in the yard. He conversed with visitors in perfectly correct French and sometimes answered in Latin but never himself began in the latter tongue. The chapel, however, was an object of terror to him. It was useless to blindfold him or to lead him in all directions through corridors. As soon as he came into the vicinity of the church, he would struggle with all his strength and refuse to go any further. His resistance was always punctuated with unnatural yells. When forced into the sacred building, he collapsed like a log, and his features took on a horrible appearance. Besprinkled with holy water, he would wriggle like a worm under a foot. Quietude returned only when he was taken out of the chapel. On October 3rd, a carriage stood ready in the yard of the orphanage to fetch Freund Strasbourg, the Reverend President of the seminary, the Reverend Mother in General, and the Reverend Father, who was to be exorcist. All was ready for the departure, when Monsignor Labbe Schranzer handed to the coachman a blessed medal of St. Benedict. The yard is bisected by a building and Taibo, walking on the other side, could have had no possible means of knowing this incident. At two o'clock, the reverend gentleman arrived from the city and immediately began the process of exorcism. The boy was forcibly taken into the chapel, where he was held fast by the abbes Schranzer and Hauser, assisted by the gardener, Monsignor André. He stood on a carpet before the communion rails, with his face turned towards the tabernacle. His color recalled that of a man under a fever. From his lips was gushing a thick froth, which flowed down to the floor. The possessed boy turned and wriggled, as though seated on a glowing furnace. Often he turned his face towards the door. Whenever the Abbe Schranzer touched his chest with a crucifix, it was seen to arch itself and swell like a balloon. Now began the ceremonies of exorcism. Father Saquat, who had been entrusted by the bishop with his difficult task, at first hesitated, not altogether convinced of it being an actual case of real possession. He having come, until then, only slightly into contact with the poor sufferer. Go away from here, shouted the satanic spirit through the mouth of the boy. Clear off, you dreckler. In the presence of five priests, the archpriest Spitz, President Stumpf, Professor Rosset, Chaplain Hosser, and Abbe Schranzer, also of six nuns and the mother of the poor boy, Father Sukkot began to recite the litany of all saints. At the words, Holy Mary, pray for us, the satanic being howled dreadfully. Out of this star, you stinker. 
I will not. In this wise, he shouted each time a great saint was invoked, and especially when they said, All ye holy angels and archangels pray for us. When the reverend father came to the words, From the snares of the devil deliver us, O Lord. The afflicted boy shook and trembled in all his limbs. His dreadful yell rent the air. He turned and twisted with such a force that the two priests and the gardener could scarcely hold him with their united efforts. After the recitation of the litany, Father Sukkot faced the boy and said over him the prayers prescribed in the ritual. The possessed cried incessantly, Away with you, foul one! Out of this sow stall! On hearing the words, Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. I will not, he cried, give glory to the Blessed Trinity. Before reading the Gospel of St. John, the priest made the sign of the cross on the victim's forehead, lips, and breast. The boy replied by growling like a bulldog and actually snapping at him as for a bite. The exorcist then questioned him, speaking in German. You spirit of darkness, crushed serpent, I, a priest of the Lord, command thee, in his almighty name, to tell me who thou art. What's that to thee, thou stink pot? I tell it to whom I like, snarled the evil one. This, continued the priest, is just a repetition of thy old proud behavior and thy defiant language before thy creator at the faithful hour of thy expulsion from heaven. But I command thee, be gone, Satan, leave this church, for thou belongest not to the house of God. Thy home is in the darkness of hell. But I will not, grinned the demon. My time is not yet come. After three hours of prayers and holy efforts, the exorcist was still resisted by the fiend. Father Soquat was bathed in sweat, tired but not dismayed. He gave up his zealous endeavors and took leave of his friends, promising to go on with the work of expulsion another day. The boy was removed from the chapel and quieted down at once. That same evening, the Abbe Schroncer had a conversation with him. You have done well, the boy said, to give a little piece of tin to him. To whom? asked the abbe. Surely to the coachman. How can you know this, and what would you have done otherwise? asked the abbe, remembering the incident, utterly unknown to the boy, of the giving of the medal of St. Benedict to the coachman. I would have knocked down men, horses, and carriage, replied the demon. I was galloping at the side of the animals. But we have been a great worry to you in the chapel, haven't we? said the abbe. Do you know the priest who, was, who has blessed you? Oh, yes, I do, answered the hellish foe. He has already once expelled one of our masters. It was a fact that Father Suquat, years before, when in Germany, had expelled the devil from a house. How could the boy have known of this exorcism through any natural means? This conversation was reported to Father Suquat and absolutely convinced him that it was a true case of diabolic possession. On the next day, Monday, the reverend gentleman returned from the city and the exorcist resumed his task. The boy was put into a straitjacket and tied onto a red armchair. The possessing devil raged more dreadfully than ever. The chair, with the boy on it, was raised into the air, and his three guards were thrown right and left by invisible bands. The roaring of the devilish spirit was ear-splitting, and the froth flowing from the boy's mouth was an object of horror not soon to be forgotten. When, after about two hours, the Reverend Father had come to the end of the liturgical prayers, he rose and addressed the demon. Now, impure spirit, thy time is at hand. I order thee, in the name of the Catholic Church, in the name of God, and in my own name as his priest, to tell me how many you are. The same sound and the same answer as before came. This has nothing to do with thee, foul one, growled the fiend. This is, replied the priest, just the proud tone thou indulgest in here on earth and which resounds in hell. 
Thy home is in the abyss of darkness, not in the abode of light. Impure Satan, depart into hell. I will not go there, replied the demon. I want to lodge in another place. I adjure thee, cried the priest once more, to tell me how many you are. We are, answered Satan, two only. What, continued the priest, is thy name? Oribas. And the other one's name? Ipes. Unclean spirits, I order you, cried the priest, to leave the house of God. You have nothing to do in it. Spirits of perdition, depart from here, said the priest. I command it in the name of the blessed sacrament. I will not, growled the master of evil. Skunk, thou hast no power over me. My hour has not yet struck. The priest trembled all over his body, and a heavy sweat ran down his face. His emotions were no less terrible than the awe and horror which overwhelmed all the onlookers. But the brave priest did not lose his courage, nor his trust in God. Again, he commenced his struggle with Satan. He took a crucifix and placed it before the boy's eyes. Thou miserable spirit, he cried. Thou darest not even behold this image. Thou turnest thy face away in order not to see it. Thou biddest defiance to the priest of God. I command thee to leave God's temple and to sink into hell, which is prepared for thee. I will not, the demon groaned. It is not good to be there. Hadst thou been obedient to thy maker, thou would not be in thy state of misery, replied the priest. Your pride has brought about your fall and your misfortune. You are a spirit of darkness. Depart. Therefore, from the light and return into the darkness assigned to you. Again, the satanic being exclaimed, My time has not yet. I will not go. On this, the priest took a candle, which had been blessed by the Pope, and said, Thou proud Satan, I place this candle on your head to light you on the way to hell. This is the light of the Catholic Church, and you are a spirit of darkness. Go back to hell and remain with those wicked spirits with whom you are associated. I'll stay here, answered the demon. Here I am comfortable. In hell, misery reigns and wretchedness. At last, Father Sukkot raised up the statue of Our Lady, saying, Behold, an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is again going to crush your head. She must mark you again and write with her name the holy name of Jesus on your breast, that they burn you forever. Still you offer resistance. I have offered your departure in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Catholic Church, and the names of our Holy Father, the Pope, and of the most blessed sacrament. You heedest not the voice of the priest. Now, therefore, it is the mother of God who orders you away. She it is who forces you to leave this boy. Unclean spirit, disappear before the face of the immaculate conception. She commands, you must obey, you must depart. While this injunction was being made, all the onlookers recited the memorare. Most solemn was this moment. Suddenly, a most horrible yell from the fiend's deep bass voice filled with echoes the sacred place. Now I must yield, cried the demon. Once more, the boy turned and twisted like a crushed serpent. A gentle cracking was observed in the juvenile body. The boy stretched himself lengthened out and collapsed like a corpse. The devil had left him. It had been an awe-inspiring sight, full of horror to all the witnesses. Only a moment ago, the fiercest rage, a face writhing in fury, the most defiant answers. Now, Tybo lies still for a whole hour in a deep sleep. He is freed. 
No longer does he fly from holy objects. He allows himself to be carried gently back into his room. There he wakes up, after a while, rubs his eyes, and looks amazed at the many unknown persons surrounding him. Do you know me? asked the Abbe Schranzer. No, I do not, answered the boy. A cry of joy is uttered by his mother. Her Taibo has recovered his sense of hearing, and he is freed from the hellish spirit. All of them thank God, who has given his church such power over hell. Full of gladness, the happy mother returns to Ilford with Taibo. She has the firm hope of witnessing in the near future the freeing of her second son, Joseph. This trust was to be realized on the 27th day of the same month. Chapter 14. Joseph also is delivered. Returned once more to his father's house, Thibault was bright and happy. But of all that happened during the faithful years of his bondage, he had not the least recollection. He did not even recognize the Abbe Bray, his parish priest, nor could he remember ever having seen the new municipal buildings. He had brought from Strasbourg some medals for his brother Joseph. When, however, he made them offer of them, the boy threw them on the floor and said, Keep that stuff for yourself. I do not want it. This behavior amazed Thibault, who, of course, we must bear in mind, knew nothing whatever, in his healed state, of the diabolic possession either of himself or of his brother, and had no idea that anything at all was the matter with Joseph. Thibault said to his mother, Has Joseph become mad? Of course, great care was taken not to divulge to him the secret cause of his brother's action. On Wednesday evening, the possessed boy Joseph shouted, My true comrades, Oribas and Ipes, the devils who have possessed Thibault, are cowards. Now I am the master. I am the strongest. I shall not depart for another six years. I am not afraid of clerics. Are you then so powerful, asked Monsignor Tresh, who was present? Certainly I am, he replied. I feel comfortable and shall stay here. I slip into a nest and leave it when I like. Meanwhile, the Abbe Bray, the parish priest, had craved his bishop's permission to attempt exorcism. The condition of the hapless Joseph grew indeed worse day by day. Thibault, on the other hand, daily frequented school and church and resumed the sacraments. He was the same boy as before the diabolic affliction. He remembered nothing of that long calamity. He was as though he passed all that time in sleep. At last, the parish priest received authorization from his bishop to attempt the exorcism of Joseph, and he proceeded to the ceremony on October 27th. Very early that morning, Joseph was taken to the cemetery chapel, a quarter of an hour's walk from Ilford. The affair was kept secret, so as to avoid a crowd. Only a few witnesses were invited. Professor Lachman of St. Hippolyte, Monsignor Ignace Space of Salestat, Monsignor Martineau, and Monsignor Tresch. The boy's parents, the schoolmaster, and Monsignor Frindel, the station master, completed the company. When at 6 a.m. Mass began, the boy became very noisy with his feet. He fidgeted about so that his hands and feet had to be manacled. At the Inchoribo, he managed to kick his legs free and flung the straps at the feet of the celebrant priest. Then Mar Monsignor Martineau bound him onto his lap. Now barking like a dog, now grunting like a pig, now emitting in a hoarse voice inarticulate sounds, he remained, however, to everybody's amazement, quite motionless from the moment of the Sanctus and until the end of the Mass. The priest Having put aside the sacred vestments, knelt with surplus and violet soul at the foot of the altar and began the prayers of exorcism, the litany of all saints and some forms of adjuration. Then he approached the possessed boy and ordered him to reveal the number of the spirits haunting him. 
You have no business to know this, replied the afflicted child. The priest reiterated his command, and the child replied, dryly, Ipes. More than this could not be extracted from him. During the reading of St. John's Gospel, the boy began to cast insults at the parish priest, shouting, under the influence of the devil possessing him, I shall not depart. During three successive hours, the exorcist took all conceivable pains in his fight for the boy's liberty. Now he placed holy relics on his head. Then he put a blessed paschal candle between his arms. Again, he sprinkled holy water over him, using, meanwhile, the most powerful formulae for expelling devils. Always, however, the demon groaned, I go not away, I will not. Those present began to feel discouraged, but the good pastor, although tired to death, exhorted them to persevere in hope. They said the rosary. Monsignor Tresh, who had held the boy all the time, delivered him over to the care of Professor Lachman. When this was done, the boy howled. Oh, you are here also, you flat nose. The priest had come back from the altar, on the steps of which he said a fervent prayer and promised novena. Turning himself towards the afflicted boy, I adjure thee, Satan, he said, in the name of the Immaculate Mother of Christ, to depart from this child. A strong sound full of rage was heard. Must this one also come, leaning on the great lady? Now I must leave him. An indescribable emotion gripped the witnesses of this drama. They were all convinced that the hour of liberation was at hand. Again, the Abbe Bray repeated this adjuration. I must yield now, growled the satanic one. I will enter into a herd of pigs. Into hell, commanded the man of God. The same words of adjuration resounded now for the third time. Let me go into a flock of geese, pleaded the fiend. Into hell, was the fiercely repeated reply. I know not the way thither, groaned the demon. I'll take my lodgment in a sheep flock. For the last time came the categorical command. To hell! With a terrible yell, Now I am forced to leave! The boy stretched out his limbs, turned in various directions, puffed up his cheeks, and made a last convulsive movement. Then he lay silent and motionless. He was unstrapped, his arms fell flat, and his head dropped backwards. After a pause, he raised his arms and stretched them out like a man awakening from a deep slumber. Then he opened his eyes, which had been closed during the whole ceremony. He looked round in amazement to find himself in a church with strange people around him. The onlookers were deeply affected. With grateful hearts, they recited the Te Deum, the Litany of Loretto, the Salve Regina, and other prayers, which were often interrupted by loud sobbing. The Abbe Bray was often obliged to pause, tears of gratitude dimming his eyes, and emotion choking his voice. How joyful was Joseph's return to his paternal home. Everyone from near and far admired the power of Our Lady, who on the solemn occasion had overthrown once more the hellish dragon. Chapter 15 Victory of Christ's Mother When one day, reader, you come, it is to be hoped you will, on a visit to Ilford, you will see a beautiful monument facing the former burner house. It is a statue of the Immaculate Conception, gilt, of cast iron, standing on a pillar of stone. This monument is 30 feet high and towers above all the surrounding buildings. On its plinth is a Latin inscription, in everlasting memory of the liberation of the two possessed boys, Tybo and Joseph Berner, obtained through the prayers of the Blessed Virgin, Mary Immaculate, in the year 1869. The good pastor, Abbe Bray, could not help paying this tribute of gratitude to the Heavenly Mother 
and his parishioners and other devout lovers of Our Lady were only too eager to contribute their might towards the erection of this noble column. It was indeed most striking that at Schlichtenheim, as well as at Ilford, the Immaculate Virgin had overcome the Prince of Darkness and again had crushed the serpent's head. All other forms of exorcism remained without result until Satan had to yield to the power of the prayers of the Great Lady. Into her hands the Almighty had placed victory, as in the realms of eternity he had bestowed it once upon Michael the Archangel in his faithful struggle with Lucifer. Mary is the potent lady, the terror of hell. To her must yield all the powers of darkness. To her be honor, glory, and gratitude throughout eternity. And now you may ask, dear reader, why the appalling possession of these pitiful children? Who had sinned, the parents or they themselves? Read chapter 9 of St. John's Gospel, which mentions the miraculous healing of the man born blind. There you will find the answer to your query. In this case also, God allowed the great affliction in order to show forth his works and to recall to mind the all-important truth of his redemption. Before the coming of the Savior, Satan in this world was almost lord and master. Almost everywhere had he set up his kingdom, the reign of unbelief, superstition, and idolatry. He could truly claim the title, Prince of this World. Christ himself called him by that name. Before dying on the cross, for the salvation of men, he said, Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. We understand these divine words to mean that, through faith in Christ, by his death and resurrection, all men of good will shall be freed from, from the domination of Satan and shall be united with their Savior. Here in love and hereafter in everlasting bliss, Christ himself, when on earth, manifested his power over Satan by expelling him from those possessed whom he met in his journeys. This same divine power he has left to his apostles and his church. In my name you shall drive out devils. In his name the apostles did this with wondrous success. And the church has to the present day always exercised the same power of exorcism, and with the same result as at Schlichtenheim and Ilford. No prince can boast such a power, no potentate, however great, but it remains in the hands of the Catholic Church and its priests. To them alone has Christ entrusted this awful privilege. Their words expel Satan, both from the souls and bodies of men. Bodily possession is, in our times, a rare event. More frequent, alas, is Satan's ownership of the soul by its being in a state of mortal sin. Satan finds every advantage in not manifesting himself too frequently in tangible, bodily possessings, for they are always accompanied by such horrors that men turn from him in disgust and come back in penitence to God, as was the case at Ilford. Satan now chooses rather to enter, secretly and in silence, into the human heart through deadly sin, and make his abode in that living temple. How much pain he takes, indeflatably, patient and cunning. With his seductive temptations, he penetrates into the spiritual vitals of man to separate him from his God, and to drag him, body and soul, into eternal misery. Once he takes possession of a heart, he robs it mercilessly of its rest and peace of the merits of its good works, of God its maker, and often, alas, finally, of eternal happiness. If, Christian reader, you had been at Ilford during those years of real devilish visitation, if, like countless witnesses, you had seen with your own eyes the hair-raising performances of the hellish spirits, would you, then, were it in your power to do otherwise, would you hug to your heart this loathsome and tyrannical foe? Would you choose to live, even if but for half an hour, with this atrocious monster? Yet, that is what you do as soon as you consent to a deliberate mortal sin. 
When you do that, then one or more unclean spirits are certainly lodging in your soul. There they remain until you repent and until the powerful word of God's absolving priest drives the fiend from you. Unfortunately, man, while alive in this world, does not realize the horrible burdensomeness of this possession of the soul by evil powers. Many live that unnatural life for weeks, maybe for years. One day, however, the mortal husk of the soul will fall into dust, and upon the unforgiven soul will fall, alas, nameless woe. If already on earth Satan deals in the cruel way which we have described with innocent children, how much more cruelly will he treat the damned? Them the anger of God will have placed within his power because of this mortal life they themselves chose his company and his domination. How dreadful beyond all expression must be this dwelling together with such hateful, infamous, godless, and wicked wretches. How much we need to pray with the pious psalmist. O Lord, abandon not to the beasts the souls that trust in thee. What reason we have for frequently repeating the liturgical invocation? From the snares of the devil, deliver us, O Lord. May we remain true in the Christian faith and keep grace in our hearts and Satan shall not harm us, either in life or in eternity. Chapter 16. Worldly Wisdom and Professorial Misconceptions Against the fact of diabolical possession, there was almost immediately raised a loud cry of opposition. The foremost to raise it were those who reject, a priori, the belief in the existence of evil spirits. They at once dispose of all such cases, together with liturgical exorcisms, with a disdainful smile, with a few pseudo-scientific phrases. Most interesting is an essay on the Ilford phenomenon by the learned non-Catholic physiologist, Professor Hopp. He had studied the case and had carefully read the booklet on it by Abbe Bray. He had also consulted ministers of religion of both denominations. He came to the conclusion that diabolic possession was something quite unintelligible to the human mind, and he could not and would not contribute, he said, towards renewing what he called the idiotic belief in such a delusion. I frankly confess, he wrote, that the exorcism performed by the Catholic priests has indeed cured the two children, but it was certainly not a case of devil expulsion. It was simply a psychic healing of their diseased brain. I recognize in both children a stereocratic derangement, and I explain the case as follows. The whole soul, that is, the animated brain in both patients, has itself imagined the devilish phantoms and has likewise been able to secure the healing, and this was done by means of the brain organism and of the psychic mechanism of the brain. The children exhibited a wonderful and immensely varied knowledge, that also was in them beforehand. It is nothing new or unheard of. The knowledge had merely been unobserved previously. Such knowledge was brought out by actual brain excitation. Neither is there anything strange nowadays in striking memory phenomena. One needs not to consider them of diabolic origin. The belief in the lodging of a devil in the human brain is too ridiculous to be taken seriously by the present day public. End quote. With all respect to your great learning, honored professor, we take the liberty of calling your arguments very weak and unscientific. The problem you have to solve is that of children who are only 8 or 10 years old. What uncommon brains must theirs have been to originate within themselves this devil phantom? Yet brains without learning or experience, without the slightest knowledge of politics or history, what wonderful cerebral organizations theirs must have been to enable children to speak fluently foreign languages they had never learned, to read the secret consciences of other men, and to reveal to them their most hidden faults. Moreover, they spoke of scientific matters with such a clearness as cannot be surpassed by experts. 
they foretold with accuracy afterwards verified by the event things which were to happen in the future. They were, these boys, born in 1855 and 1857. Yet their memories recalled particular events that took place in certain Ilford families during the Swedish War of 1639 and during the Revolution times of 1794. To attribute such phenomena to a hysteric choreatic derangement and to explain them away with high-sounding words is really too ridiculous, learned professor. It only shows to what depths of absurdity a learned man falls when he denies the supernatural at any price. Naturally, the whole chorus of anti-religious newspapers of the day chimed in likewise. A specimen is found in the journal D.L. Kirk, dated January 18, 1868. Quote, In regards to devils, we have become fairly skeptical. And, when mention is made of possessed people, we cannot help laughing. But superstition is a fact. It is with us. We cannot then raise our voices loudly enough against ideas which are fostered in the minds of the people for purposes which we do not wish to subject to closer examination. The two children who were first treated by several doctors were entrusted afterwards to the care of a lady hypnotizer. Then one of them was taken to a Capuchin monastery in our neighborhood and subjected there to a very odd treatment. The devils, however, would not yield, and the fuss which was already widespread, increased. What was to be done? All remedies seemed to be exhausted when the government had the lucky thought to order an inquiry to be made on the spot by the brigadier of the police. What was beyond the powers of science, mysticism, and exorcism was easily done by a gentleman and galloons. At his first visit, the boys sweetened down. Their mental condition became clarified. Their movements became natural, and the devil fled to all other devils. Happy journey. End quote. In this way, a newspaper scribbler writes history, not in Spain or in Holland, but only 10 kilometers from Ilford. Had he only dared to pay a personal visit to the children, what an interesting examination of conscience the devil would have made for him. In another number of the same paper, dated February 1st, 1868, another correspondent, with a pretense of wit, waxed sarcastic in the following article. Quote, The devil is at Ilford, with a rich harvest for newsmongers, great and small. In two weak creatures, Satan has taken up his lodging. Without being armed with Hercules club, they eclipse all the exploits of the half-god and his labors. Crucifixes and amulets suspended round their neck are being reduced to powder, with a great noise and accompaniment of green and blue flames and sulfurous perfumes. The children predict the future, and without rope or bell, they ring the funeral knell of those about to die. And these are evidently but preludes. Every day will bring a new miracle until it pleases Satan. May his wish be long delayed, to return for a time to his own domain. But enlightened minds, and I am not unaware, going to ask some indiscreet questions. They want to know why young children, in preference to many other people who undoubtedly had better titles to such honors, have deserved the painful glory of lodging the horned god. When they are told of hoarse cries, of haggard eyes, of convulsions, of spasms, they simply answer, hysteria, vapors, epilepsy. Instead of holy water, they recommend shower baths, strong nourishing food, and even the regime so dear to Monsignors Florent, Pergom, and Diatorius. Happy if they do not argue that believers and exorcists, especially the latter, have not themselves a devil in their body and that most refractory one of all, the devil of absurdity, end quote. We wish to show by such examples with what frivolous wantonness the unbelieving world judge these rare phenomena, a world which, of set purpose, 
disdained to subject them to a close and dignified inquiry. The Christian doctrine of hell and lost angels does not suit them. Consequently, they dispose of it with shrugs and cheap mockery. Much more reserved were the doctors who had treated the children in the first period of the affliction, especially Dr. Kraft, Dr. Henry Weyer, Dr. Alfred Zertecki of Mulhouse. They found no natural explanation for the sickness and dared not pass judgment on its mysterious nature. The government physician of the canton, Dr. Levy, openly said to Abbe Bray that his science was of no use in this case and that the Catholic Church had better remedies for it. The news of the possession and liberation of the two boys spread as far as Paris. The great boulevard papers commented on it, and not always in a favorable sense. For example, Edmund About printed a correspondence in his Opinion Nationale, which represented the case as mere humbug, and represented that the children were still languishing in their state of misery. The Industrial Alcyon and the Journal de Comar inserted this article in their columns. Then the diocesan authorities had to take sides in refutation of this lie. The editors received from the pen of the Vicar General, Monsignor Rapp, the following rap on the nose. And the letter reads as follows. Strasbourg, January 9th, 1870. To the editor, dear sir, you published in your number dated January 7th a correspondence from Strasbourg which calls for some corrections. At Ilfert, a small boy had for four years been afflicted by an extraordinary disease of which the doctors were unable to determine the cause or nature. On repeated requests from the mayor of the parish and from the parish priest, an inquiry was ordered by his lordship the bishop. It was decided that the child should be brought to the orphanage at Schlichtenheim, which is under the care of the Sisters of Charity. For some time, extraordinary facts, which it is superfluous to describe here, but which shall be published with all necessary details in a religious paper of Alsace, continued to occur, and the Episcopal Commission, of which nobody, except your correspondent, contests the wisdom and the authority, deemed it necessary to assign to these facts only a supernatural cause. The Church has prayers for such cases, even when they are doubtful. These prayers have been said over the child, and he is completely cured. Your correspondent says the contrary of the truth when he tells the public that the boy is still in his state of disease. The mockeries and insults wherewith your correspondent has spiced his article may have gratified his readers. I have no concern with them. It is only my intention to reestablish the facts, and I expect of your fairness that you will insert this letter in one of your early issues. Signed, Rapp, Vicar General. Letter from Thibault Berner to Rector Husser, formerly chaplain of St. Charles' Orphanage. Whilst the younger boy Joseph, at the beginning of his affliction, was only eight years old and could scarcely read and write, Thibault, his senior, had already made some progress at school, so that he was able, though imperfectly and not without mistakes, to read and write both French and German. When, however, a crisis came, during the diabolic possession, both children spoke several languages perfectly and would talk to visitors for hours in faultless French. It will interest our readers to glance over a letter written by Thibault in the month of his liberation to the chaplain Abbe Hasser. We reproduce it exactly as in the original, retaining all its quaint errors of spelling. Ilford, October 31st, 1869. Monsignor Labbe, dear chaplain, I am much honored in telling you my gratitude for all the favors I have received at your house through our Lord Jesus Christ and his most holy mother. It is at your home that I had, with many thanks, the happiness of being freed from my supernatural evils. I am very happy now, more happy than ever. And I rejoice with my brother Joseph, 
who has been cured of the same affliction on the 27th of October, by our dear parish priest, and today, Sunday, all the people flock to the church. We have all celebrated our solemn Te Deum for this happy favor, and have rung bells and had benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Now we go to church and school as though we had never been ill, but I think it must have been a strange illness because we cannot remember the slightest pain. But, thanks be to God, we are healed. I finish this letter with the thought of the Almighty, and I commend myself to your prayers. Receive my respectful salutations. Tybo Burner. And also, kind regards to the Reverend Mother Superior and to Sister Damase, and a greeting from my parents to all the sisters. And now to the appendix, which is the report of the Episcopal Commission. The following is a copy of the report of the commission referred to in chapter 11. On Tuesday morning, April 13th, 1869, at 10 o'clock, the three reverend gentlemen, Freiberger, Sester, and Stumpf, went straight to the presbytery. The parish priest, Abbe Bray, was unfortunately absent, but the mayor, Monsignor Tresch, quickly made his appearance and offered to show the way to the famous house of the Burners. Not wishing to be seen by the children, who used often to sit near the window, the visitors went round the house and entered by the back door. The mother received them. She was a poor woman, 40 years of age, and having an appearance of one suffering under great mental depression. They found one boy only. He was sitting at a table, winding some reels of cotton into skeins. He was Tybo. Joseph was hiding under a bed in the adjoining room. He offered the most violent opposition to attempts to drag him from his seclusion, and great efforts were needed before he could be drawn forth. He covered his face and refused to look at anyone for ten minutes. Monsignor Tresch took up a position on the threshold between the two rooms in order to prevent a possible escape. Taibo continued his work with the cotton reels. He is a handsome boy, between 13 and 14 years old, and completely deaf. His behavior is modest and calm. His gaze is simple and sincere. His face is candid but drawn and sad. After a few moments, Monsignor Stumpf takes from his pocket a metal blessed by our Holy Father the Pope. He presents it to Joseph, whose age seems 11 years. He is a little rascal full of sportive trickeries and very quick with his eyes. He keeps his head down. He seems to take no serious view of anything, but always to be ready for mischief. Heedless, mocking, and taking no notice of the coaxings or even of the gentle blows with which Monsignor Tresh gratified him. He had no sooner perceived the metal than he knocked it from the hands of the visitor and drew back as far as the wall, threatening to defend himself with kicks. Monsignor Tresh picked up the medal and asked him to kiss it. The boy, however, struggled violently with him, grinning and writhing in a strange way. All this time, Taibo remained silent, throwing only two or three indifferent glances at Joseph. Then Monsignor Stump presents him with the medal. Immediately, Taibo thrust on one side the reels which had been interesting him so much and drew back terrified. His face became scarlet. As soon as he was left alone, he became quiet. He put the reels into a box and sat modestly behind the table. When Messinger Sester and Freiberger sat beside him, he reddened, became fidgety, and went back to the wall. As soon as he was again left alone, he played with papers on the table, sharpened the nails of his fingers, but displayed constant anxiety as one fearing a new attack. Monsignor Tresh threw holy water on his fingers. Immediately he became violently agitated. He tried to run away, but finding no exit, he dropped on the floor to hide under the table. Monsignor Tresh, however, kept him back and put him in front of the, of the reverend visitors on another bench, at the foot of the bed, besides Monsignor Stumpf. The boy, however, saw at the other extremity of the bench. 
Now, the bed itself was hidden from view by a curtain of blue cotton hanging from the ceiling. Monsignor Sester, unseen by the boy, sprinkled the inner side of the curtains with holy water. Behold the portent! A great perturbation in the boy, as under the weight of an enormous, mysterious pain. Meanwhile, Monsignor Stumpf took an image from his breviary and offered it to the child, who repelled it with violence. Monsignor Tresh, however, held him tightly gripped in his arms. Then Monsignor Stumpf placed the pictured image on the child's head. The boy violently shook his head until the image fell from it. This action seemed to tire the poor patient very much. He perspired and wiped his face with both his sleeves. His breathing became difficult. While this was going on, little Joseph had jumped out of the window and went to play with his little brothers and sisters in front of the house. The mother gives interesting details about the boys. They were always good and were very fond of school. Four years ago, coming from their class, their behavior changed mysteriously. Thibault had convulsions during the night, especially at 10 o'clock and at midnight. His voice was not the same, and he had lost consciousness. His tone and speech had become a hoarse bass, and it remained so during all the four subsequent years. The commission of inquiry left the house about noon. Their mind was made up. They had witnessed the abnormal condition under which the boys were laboring and gained the conviction that it was a case of diabolic possession. Monsignor Tresh went to see the children at 10 o'clock that same evening. Do you know, he asked, the reverend gentleman who called on you today? You say gentleman? I am myself a greater gentleman. Where do they come from? asked Monsignor Tresh. One, answered the boy, from Mulhouse, not far from here. Which one? asked Monsignor Tresh. The one, answered the boy, who often went out and who had not a very strong opinion about my case, but the two others have a very strong and firm wrist. What about the one who presented you with a picture? queried Monsignor Tresh. Where does he come from? From Strasbourg, replied the boy. He is doing me most harm. The cleric with a great cap, meaning the, the mitred bishop, has sent him. And the third gentleman, continued Monsignor Tresh, he comes from Eisenheim, replied the child. The poor boy was deaf, but the parents did not know it. He told me, I am going to find ways and means to put you off the track and to render you incredulous alike with Monsignor Stumpf. And that was a letter written by Monsignor Tresh to Monsignor Stumpf, April 15th. 1869. And here ends the book on the true story of the famous diabolic possession in Alsace. I hope you enjoyed this three-part series of the Catholic Storyteller. This just goes again to prove the power of evil, but also the greater power of Christ through the church, through sacramentals, through the rite of exorcism, and especially the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who crushes the head of the serpent. And who is it that hates Our Lady in union with Satan? It is the enemies of the church, the enemies of Christ, the enemies of truth. Who mocks Our Lady? Who denigrates her? The Jews in the Talmud, the Protestants, the Freemasons, the communists and atheists, all of them equally hate Our Lady. Think about that. Think about that the next time a Protestant attacks Our Lady and her divine motherhood. She is mother of Christ. She is the mother of God, ever Virgin Mary. And as the book of Genesis states, and as I always put at the end of my videos, the image of Our Lady crushing the head of the serpent in Genesis, our Lord already predicted his mother's sinlessness and her victory over the evil one. And indeed, she shall crush his head.